Hello and welcome to Brain Map Anatomy. Today we will discuss the first 10 questions and their answers which were posted in Brain Map Anatomy Facebook page, Instagram profile, and in our YouTube channel. If you want to see the questions before separately, check out the playlist. We suggest you spend one minute on each question, find an answer, and then check with this video. Also if you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, kindly press the subscribe button. More videos will be uploaded as the number of subscribers rise. Question 1. Middle meningeal artery enters the cranial cavity through which foramen? The right answer is option C which is foramen spinosum. Middle meningeal artery is a branch of the first portion of the maxillary artery. It is given off at the infratemporal fossa and enters the cranial cavity through the foramen spinosum and supply the dura mater and the skull vault. The image shown is the interior of the skull with the skull vault removed to visualize the cranial fossae. The cranial fossae are divided into three. Anterior cranial fossa, middle cranial fossa and posterior cranial fossa. Options A, B, and C show foramina in the middle cranial fossa while option D lies in the posterior cranial fossa. We will discuss the right option, which is option C. It is the foramen spinosum present in the sphenoid bone, just lateral to the foramen ovale. The structures passing through the foramen spinosum are a middle meningeal artery, middle meningeal vein, and meningeal branch of the mandibular nerve which is called as nervous spinaceus. An emissary vein also passes through the foramen spinosum. Option A is foramen rotundum, communicating to the pterygopalatin fossa. Option B is foramen ovale, communicating to infratemporal fossa. Option D is present in the posterior cranial fossa. It is called the jugular foramen. Take home message. Foramen spinosum is a present in the sphenoid bone and communicates between middle cranial fossa and infratemporal fossa. Structures passing through the foramen are middle meningeal vessels, emissary vein, and nervous spinaceous. Question 2. Which cranial nerve is responsible for lacrimation? The right answer is option B, cranial nerve 7 which is the facial nerve. The lacrimatory nucleus is present in the brainstem at the level of the pons. The fibers from the lacrimatory nucleus carry the presynaptic parasympathetic fibers destined to reach the lacrimal gland. These fibers are carried by nervous intermedius of the facial nerve. At the geniculate ganglion, a branch called greater petrosal nerve is given off from the nervous intermedius. Greater petrosal nerve joins with the deep petrosal nerve at the pterygoid canal. The deep petrosal nerve carries the sympathetic fibers from superior cervical ganglion which wraps around the internal carotid artery. The greater and deep petrosal nerve joins to form the nerve of the pterygoid canal, also called as the vidian nerve. Now the nerve reaches the pterygopalatin fossa. The parasympathetic fibers synapses at the pterygopalatin but the sympathetic fibers just passes through it without relaying. The efferent fibers from the ganglion are taken through the zygomatic nerve, then through zygomaticotemporal nerve and finally reaches the end organ which is the lacrimal gland through the lacrimal nerve. Take home message. Cranial nerve number 7, facial nerve is responsible for lacrimation. Question 3. Patient on examination presents with gaze defect, ptosis, and midriasis. It is asked to localize the level of the lesion. The right answer is option C. The lesion is at the midbrain level at the level of superior colliculus on the left side. In the given picture, the left eye of the patient has gaze defect, ptosis, and midriasis. Students must remember that lesions at brain stem can have ipsilateral and, or contralateral features. Here the patient's present with the classical symptoms of oculomotor nerve palsy. The oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve 3, supplies all the extraocular muscles except superior oblique and lateral rectus. So the patient with damage to the oculomotor nerve will have downward and lateral gaze defect due to the unopposed action of lateral rectus and superior oblique. Ptosis is caused because the oculomotor nerve supplies the levator palpebri superioris which helps in the elevation of the eyelid. Midriasis results from damage of oculomotor nerve because the nerve carries the fibers from edinger westphal nucleus which synapses at the ciliary ganglion and the postganglionic fibers supply sphincter pupillae. The damage is localized to the left side because, in the course of origin of the oculomotor nerve from the midbrain to its terminal branches, the nerve does not cross the midline. 
So ipsilateral damage is seen. Take home message. Oculomotor nerve arises from midbrain at the level of the superior colliculus. Damage to the oculomotor nerve causes lateral gaze defect, ptosis, and midriasis. Question 4. Identify uncus in the given picture. Option B is the right answer. The anterior end of parahippocampal gyrus hooks sharply backwards at uncus. The uncus is limited laterally by a short rhinal sulcus. Space occupying lesions in middle cranial fossa caused by tumor, hemorrhage, or edema, can push the uncus over the tentorial notch against the brain stem and its corresponding cranial nerves and can result in a brain herniation. If the uncus becomes herniated the structure lying just medial to it, the cranial nerves can become compressed. This causes problems associated with a non-functional or problematic cranial nerve 3, the pupil on the ipsilateral side fails to constrict to light and absence of medial and superior movement of the orbit, resulting in a fixed, dilated pupil and an eye with a characteristic down and out position due to dominance of the abducens and trochlear nerves. Refer to question number 3 for more details of this lesion. Take home message. The anterior end of parahippocampal gyrus hooks sharply backwards at uncus. Question 5. What is the root value of the affected nerve? The right answer is option C. The clinical condition shown in the picture is the winging of the right scapula. You can see the prominent medial border of the right scapula. This happens due to the paralysis of a muscle called serratus anterior which gets inserted onto the medial border of the coastal surface of the scapula. This muscle, serratus anterior is supplied by the nerve to serratus anterior, which is also called nerve of bell or long thoracic nerve arising from the roots of C5, C6, and C7 of brachial plexus. An injury to nerve to serratus anterior on the right side caused winging of the scapula in this case. Take home message. Nerve to serratus anterior arises from C5, 6, and 7 roots. Injury to this nerve causes paralysis of serratus anterior muscle resulting in winging of the scapula. Question 6. Racing car sign is seen in which condition? The right answer is option B colossal agenesis. The image shown is an axial MRI of the brain with the racing car sign. Appearances on axial MRI or CT reminds us of a Formula 1 car seen from above, with the tires represented by the widely spaced frontal horns and the dilated trigons due to agenesis of the corpus callosum. Corpus callosum is the band of white matter commissural fibers connecting the two hemispheres in the brain. Agenesis of the corpus callosum is a rare congenital disorder with complete or partial absence of the corpus callosum. Individuals with corpus callosal agenesis have difficulty transferring complex information from one hemisphere to the other. Take home message. Racing car sign is seen in imaging of the brain in corpus callosal agenesis. Question 7. Nerve supply to orbicularis oculi is derived from which cranial nerve? The right answer is option C, cranial nerve 7, the facial nerve. The orbicularis oculi is a striated, voluntary muscle of facial expression that closes the eyelids. It arises from the nasal part of the frontal bone, from the frontal process of the maxilla in front of the lacrimal groove, and from the medial palpebral ligament. The fibers are directed laterally, occupies the eyelids and surrounds the circumference of the orbit. Without any exceptions, all the muscles of facial expression are supplied by cranial nerve number 7. Take home message. Orbicularis oculi is a muscle of facial expression surrounding the orbital orifice extending into eyelids. Derived from the second pharyngeal arch, all muscles of facial expression are supplied by the facial nerve. Question 8. Which among the muscle is not a hip abductor? The right answer is option A gluteus maximus. Abduction at the hip joint is brought about by gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, and tensor fasciae lati. Gluteus medius and minimus also help in the internal rotation of the hip joint, the action of gluteus maximus is extension of the hip joint. Take home message. Gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, and tensor fasciae lati are the three muscles which abduct the hip joint. Question 9. Boundaries of the triangle of Koch is formed by all structures except which among the following? The right answer is option D. Crista terminalis. Triangle of Koch is defined by the following structures within the right atrium. The ostium of the coronary sinus, 
posteriorly, the anterior septal leaflet commissure, and the tendon of Tadero. Triangle of Koch is used as an anatomical landmark for the location of the atrioventricular node during electrophysiology procedures such as pacing or ablation. The line of union between the right atrium and the right atrial appendage is present on the interior of the atrium in the form of a vertical crest, known as the crista terminalis which represents the junction between the sinus venosus and the heart in the developing embryo. On the external aspect of the right atrium, corresponding to the crista terminalis is a groove, the terminal sulcus or commonly known as sulcus terminalis. The crista terminalis provides the origin for the pectinate muscles. Take home message. Triangle of Koch is bounded by coronary sinus, septal leaflet, and the tendon of Tadero. Question 10. How many genes are coded by human mitochondrial DNA? The right answer is option B37. This is pretty much a direct question from genetics topic. The human mitochondrial DNA, mtDNA, is a double-stranded, circular molecule of 16,569 base pairs and contains 37 genes. The mammalian mitochondrial genome is transmitted exclusively through the female germline. That finishes the discussion of the first 10 questions. If you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, kindly press the subscribe button. More videos will be uploaded as the number of subscribers increase. Kindly use the comment box below for your feedback and suggestions. See you another day. Enjoy the learning process.